Maybe this was a dumb idea, I thought as I stood in the small balcony of our cozy room. Maybe there's no saving our marriage. Maybe we've just grown too far apart. The depthless waves of the Pacific Ocean lapped at the massive cruise ship's hull, some 80 feet below. We were moving steadily toward Hawaii, motoring toward the setting sun. The carpet of waves stretching to the northern horizon faded from majestic blue to eerie black in the dying daylight. I peered down at the waves below, leaning my forearms against the metal railing. Hey, neighbor, a man called from my left. I looked that way and saw Jim Thurman looking toward me from the adjacent room's railing. He was leaning out so he could see past the partition that separated the two balconies, designed to give some semblance of privacy on the boat in which 3,000 people were packed like sardines. Hey, Jim, I said, smiling wanly at the good-natured but not too bright sandy-haired man. Jim's wife, Heidi, was my wife's best friend and the entire reason we were on this cruise. It had been Heidi's idea, and she'd convinced Nadia that it would do us some good. After all, according to Heidi, their yearly cruises had helped put the spark back in Jim and Heidi's marriage. Want a beer? Jim asked, disappearing before I could answer, and then reappearing with a can of Heineken extended toward me. Sure, I said, taking the beer and cracking it open. We toasted and clunked our cans together. I drank deeply, feeling a slight head change almost immediately. I wasn't a big drinker, but when your marriage is on its last legs, I guess there's not much more to do. The sliding glass door behind me opened, and Nadia stepped out onto the patio, tentatively, as if she was invading my space. I turned to her. Hey. Hi, she said. Her eyes were dry now although they hadn't been five minutes earlier, when I'd stepped onto the balcony after yet another argument. Jim disappeared around the partition, and I heard the sliding glass door to his room close. At least he knew how to read a room. Nadia stepped to the railing next to me, bending to rest her arms on it. I turned and did the same. There was only a sliver of orange light on the horizon to our left. To our right, beyond the back of the ship, was nothing but blue-black sky over a darker shade of blue-black water. The salt water smell fought with the malty scent coming from my beer. I took another drink. You know, Nadia said, cutting herself off mid-sentence. What? I asked, genuinely interested. She needed to get something off her chest. It seemed like she always needed to get something off her chest. She looked at me opening her mouth to speak. But before she could get a sound out, the ship lurched, causing us both to stumble toward the front of the vessel. It felt as if we'd run into something, but when I looked forward, all I could see was the open ocean. What the heck? Nadia asked. Maybe we hit a sandbar. In the middle of the Pacific? I don't think so. She was right. We'd already been cruising for a day and it wasn't like there was any land nearby. Usually, sandbars were located near land, as far as I knew. I heard doors opening all around us, above and below and on both sides, as people came out to see what had caused the entire ship to lurch. Jim and Heidi stuck their heads out from the balcony, looking toward the front of the ship. When they didn't see anything, they glanced our way. What was that? Jim asked. I shrugged. We're seeing what you're seeing. The near constant buzz of the ship's engine suddenly failed and then stopped altogether. It was such a low and constant vibration that I didn't notice it had been there until it stopped. You feel that? Jim asked. They shut off the engines, Heidi said. I looked out at the ocean waves. They were small and the ocean was relatively calm. But as I glanced out at the distant waves in the last of the daylight, I could have sworn I saw something pop out of the water for a brief moment. Given the way the fading sunlight bounced off the moving water, it was little more than a silhouette, there and then gone. I shrugged it off at first, thinking it was a curious dolphin or one of the millions of animals that called the ocean home. But as minutes passed while Nadia and I chatted with Jim and Heidi from our balcony, the image of that thing popping up from the ocean refused to leave me. 
By the time the sky was dark in all directions, I felt sure that what I'd seen wasn't a dolphin. But what I thought I had seen made no sense. After all, what would a person be doing out in the middle of the ocean like that? And if it was a person, why wouldn't they have called out for help? It started as we were on our way back from dinner two hours later. While we had been getting ready for dinner, the captain made an announcement over the ship's PA system. He said that they had a minor technical problem and had stopped the engines out of an abundance of caution. He expected the ship to be underway in the next couple of hours and assured us that there would be plenty of time to get to Hawaii on schedule so we could enjoy the tropical islands for a few days before heading back to the mainland on the ship. Nadia and I had dressed in silence. She looked great in her little black dress, but every time I looked at her, I thought about her co-worker Shane's hands all over her. It made me feel sick. She'd done the right thing and had come clean about the affair shortly after it happened. I thought I could forgive her, but it wasn't so easy. The hardest part, I found, wasn't just looking into her eyes after she'd cheated on me with another man. The hardest part was looking myself in the eye. After all, I wasn't without blame. I hadn't been enough for her. I hadn't kept things exciting or engaging enough. I had driven her away. So as I dressed in the tailored suit I usually only wore to weddings, I couldn't stand to look at myself in the mirror. When we were finally seated at the dinner table with Jim and Heidi in the fancy dining room, I ordered wine and worked on adding to the buzz from the beer Jim had given me. By the time we left the dining room, I felt as if the ship was rolling under my feet, even though Jim was certain we hadn't started moving again. I wasn't paying too much attention to where we were going, I just followed the group. I'd heard something about hitting the casino. It was fine with me, because I just wanted another drink. We stepped into one of the main common areas of the ship. It was like the ship's version of a downtown shopping area. The ceiling was four stories up and made of glass. The ground floor was lined with shops and restaurants, whereas the other three stories were lined with interior room balconies. People were all around, doing some shopping, heading to dinner, or just walking around to see the sights of the city on water. As we walked among the small trees and shrubs that gave the middle of the area a park-like feel, a loud thud came from over to our right. It was followed quickly by a terrified scream. All heads turned that way. What I saw didn't immediately register through the fog of alcohol slowing my thoughts. It was a man lying face down just outside a restaurant's doors. At first I thought he'd just tripped and fell down, but the people immediately around him were pointing up. I followed their fingers and saw a strange head poking out over the top balcony. It was pale white with what looked like two sets of black eyes, one stacked on top of the other. The nose was nothing more than two slits in the rubber-like skin. I saw no mouth. The figure quickly ducked out of view, back into the room. Then all hell broke loose. Several more balcony doors opened and people ran out, screaming. One woman flung a leg over the balcony railing before she was yanked back toward the room by some unseen force. I grabbed Nadia's hand as we looked around in shock. People at the other side of the shopping area started running toward us, dropping their shopping bags as they ran. As the crowd parted briefly, I caught a glimpse of what they were running from. Dozens of gruesome looking creatures scurried after people on four white crab-like legs. Between each pair of legs was a semi-transparent web that ended just above the knee joint, making it look almost as if they were wearing clothes. Where the four legs joined, there was a humanoid body from the waist up, but instead of two arms, each creature had four arms, two on each side. Between each arm to the elbow was a similar semi-transparent web. The two top arms ended in tri-fingered hands, while the two bottom ones ended in large claws. These nightmare creatures were large, as big as an average human. Their heads sat on thick necks with four black eyes, two slits for nostrils, and no mouths that I could see. But I soon saw why no mouths appeared on their faces. A large man in Bermuda shorts and a loud Hawaiian shirt tripped to the ground, landing on his belly. One of the creatures leaped on him from 10 yards away, propelled through the air in a graceful maneuver by its powerful legs. 
It landed directly over the man and stood for a moment, like a crab protecting its meal. As the man screamed and tried to scramble away, a set of massive pink jaws shot down from the area where the legs all came together. Sharp, clearish teeth glistened with saliva as they shot down, impaling the man through the back with a splash of blood. The jaws gathered meat and pulverized bone from the man's insides and shot back up into the creature before repeating the entire process again in quick succession. If Nadia hadn't yanked me away, I likely would have stared at the spectacle until I was eaten by one of the creatures. And it wouldn't have taken long. I knew as I glanced up and saw these strange beings crawling over the balconies above, many of them splashed with blood. Apparently, they'd given up any effort at hiding and were now in a full feeding frenzy. As we moved out of the shopping area, a glance behind me revealed dozens of these things, scuttling around or feeding on the poor folks who'd been unlucky enough to be caught. Jim and Heidi took the lead, pulling Nadia and I along as we headed back to our rooms. The ship was in full chaos, with people running around screaming. As we moved, the massive ship shifted under our feet. It felt like it was tilting first one way and then the other. By this point, I was sober enough to know that it wasn't my equilibrium that was off. Something was happening to the ship. When we finally reached our floor, we were surprised to find that the hallway was fairly empty. Several cabin doors were open, and there were a small number of dropped items littering the hallway floor. Otherwise, it was fairly calm. Any screams we heard seemed to be coming from elsewhere. As we moved cautiously toward our rooms, we came to an open cabin door. Inside, a dead woman lay on her back. There was a gaping hole where her stomach had once been. A circle of gore surrounded her. Nadia retched as we hurried past. I urged her on, thinking only of getting to our cabin where we could, hopefully, wait out this madness. Jim, who was in the lead, suddenly froze. I looked past him, down the hall, to see that one of the creatures now stood in the hallway, staring at us with its unfathomable black eyes. Run! Jim screamed, pulling us forward. Our rooms were just up ahead. As we ran forward, the creature moved like a spider, closing the distance fast. Your room! Jim called since ours was the closer one. I pulled out my room key, hand shaking as I tried to put it in the slot. I could hear the creature closing on us. It wasn't far. Nadia grabbed my hand, steadying it enough for us to slip the key in. The indicator light turned green and the door unlocked. I shoved the door open and pushed Nadia inside, turning to usher Heidi and Jim inside, but it was too late. The creature launched itself, slamming into Jim and knocking him to the carpet. Jaws shot out of its underside and crashed through Jim's rib cage like a hammer through old plastic. I pulled a screaming Heidi into the room with me and slammed the door, making sure it was locked before engaging the doorstop. Peering out the peephole, I could see the creature still feeding on Jim, its head twisted around to stare at the door. I backed away, barely registering Heidi's screams. The ship seemed to move again. It felt like it was in an elevator that was going down. I turned and looked out the sliding glass doors, but it was too dark to see anything. Nadia stood at the doors, staring out at the night. She reached out and pulled the door open. Nadia, don't! I shouted. She ignored me, stepping out onto the balcony, looking down toward the water. After a moment, she turned and stared back at me. The expression on her face made my whole body go cold. Thinking of nothing other than giving her what comfort I could, I moved around the bed and stepped out onto the balcony wrapping my wife in a hug. She hugged me back as I looked down over the balcony railing, seeing the entire side of the ship crisscrossed with strange, organic-looking vines or ropes. They were dripping water and covered in seaweed, and they were attached to various places on the first and second floors of the ship. A few creatures scurried up those rope-like objects, towing other ropes with them, which they attached as well. The ship shuddered, and massive bubbles came to the surface of the water right around the midship mark. Suddenly, all those ropes tightened, and the ship started to get pulled down into the water. Further back, I saw a rescue boat being lowered onto two mechanical winches toward the water. I couldn't see how many people were inside the enclosed rescue boat, but I watched as several people jumped from the ship and down onto the bright orange boat. For a moment, I thought they were going to make it, but as soon as the rescue boat touched the waves, dozens of the creatures emerged from the water and invaded the boat. 
I looked away from the carnage and the approaching water, still holding tight to Nadia. I knew there wasn't anything to be done. There was nowhere to go, and there was no rescue coming. As the creaking ship was pulled into the water, I told Nadia that I loved her. I love you too, she said. I'm sorry. It's okay, I said. It's okay. I glanced over the balcony again, seeing the water flooding into the rooms one floor below. I could see dozens of white creatures swimming swiftly just below the ocean's surface, using the webs on their arms and legs to propel themselves through the water. But most of these creatures were much smaller than the ones I'd seen. It didn't take long to realize why. They were the babies, the children. The adults had done the hunting. Now they were bringing the food to the young ones. As the water swirled around my ankles, I held Nadia tighter. Then we were in the water. Nadia's nails dug into my back as our heads went under the waves. I opened my eyes, seeing, in the still functioning lights from the ship, thousands of those white creatures, big and small, swimming up from the depths. It was feeding time. We got a jump seater today. Becky says as I prepare for passenger boarding. Oh yeah? I ask. A pilot or a flight attendant? Pilot, she says. Is that the one you had a date with last month? I ask, making sure the coffee is brewing. God, I hope not, she says. He was so desperate. I thought he would start humping my leg as we walked out of the restaurant. I laugh aloud and gesture at the nearby cockpit door, which is wide open. Better keep your voice down. Pilots don't like it when you disparage one of their own. Becky, who is probably the most in-your-face person I've ever met, cocks one immaculate eyebrow and turns to face the cockpit with a smile on her face. Nah, these boys don't mind. We have the good pilots today. Isn't that right, boys? Uh, that's correct, ma'am, Captain Castro says, doing his captain's voice, like he's talking over the intercom to a plane full of people. We are, uh, the best pilots, and you are the best crew. Uh, yeah. Chuckling, I shake my head, knowing it's going to be a good flight. For the record, I know lots of pilots who are liable to hump your leg, Becky. McCord, the first officer says. I can hook you up if you want. I'll keep that in mind if I ever get desperate. Thanks, first officer. A shadow comes over the open plane door, and a shrill ringing suddenly comes into my ears. A taste like old metal invades my mouth. I look over toward the door to see a man in a pilot's uniform standing there, with three stripes on his jacket sleeves to show that he's a first officer. He looks normal, clean shaven, short brown hair, droopy eyes, and the flabby body of a middle-aged man who spends most of his time sitting down. But I find I can barely stand to look at him. He's not normal. Something tells me he's wrong somehow. I'm your jump seater he says, smiling hesitantly, holding a small overnight bag in one hand and his credentials in the other. Welcome aboard, Becky says. I'm Becky, and this is Jacob. Glenn Mercer, the guy says. Come on in, Castro says from the cockpit. We're just getting ready to board. Becky takes the man's bag and stows it in a nearby overhead bin. I stare at the man, wondering why I have such a bad feeling. The last time I had a feeling like this, I try to shake it off as he goes into the cockpit. He's off duty and he's hitching a ride with us in what's called the jump seat, which is located inside the cockpit. It's how many off-duty pilots get around since much of the time, their first or last flight of the day is from some city other than the one where they live. Becky turns to me and stops short. What's wrong with you? She asks. You're not about to puke, are you? I shake my head the ill feeling fading slightly. No, I'm okay. Okay, Becky says, unsure. Then she heads back to the rear galley to make sure everything is ready to go for the flight. I glance inside the cockpit at Glenn Mercer, who's talking with the captain and first officer. All three men seem at ease. Their voices are friendly. As I finish getting ready to board passengers, I try not to think about the last time I had a strange feeling like this. It was so long ago. I had been telling myself for years that it hadn't really been a premonition. I told myself it was a trick of my memory, making me think I foresaw the tragedy as a way to try to cope with something I couldn't really comprehend. 
But now, I'm not so sure. Maybe I did have a premonition all those years ago. And maybe I'm having another one now. Cabin crew, prepare for takeoff. Captain Castro says over the PA system. The safety briefing is done and the full manifest of passengers are in their seats. Outside, the sun is setting. As I settle into my jump seat near the front of the plane, the cabin lights flicker off for a moment. When they come back on, I'm staring at a plane full of dead people. Rotting flesh hangs off their bones, exposing skeletal grins. Shriveled eyes still remain in some sockets, but most of them are empty, sightless, and black. Their heads loll against the seat backs, and their arms hang limply into the aisle. I blink, the paralyzing fear of the vivid tapestry allowing me to do nothing else. And in the moment it takes my eyelids to close and open again, the dead people change. They come alive. Their lipless mouths fall open to release screams. 200 terrified screams, all becoming one deafening din. Then the lights flicker back on, and the people are as they were moments before. They're alive, bored, staring at their phones or reading books or chatting with their neighbors. Instinctively, I reach for the seatbelt clasp at my waist. But just as my hand touches the metal, the plane's engines roar as we start to barrel down the runway. Shaking my head, I chastise myself. Get your shit together, I think. Everything's okay, everything's fine. I don't really believe it, but I want to. I think that we'll be landing back in the United States in just a few hours and everything will be fine. I'll go home to my partner and my dog and I'll put this terrible day behind me. I'm so distracted, I forget to do the silent review we're supposed to do before every takeoff and landing. Pretty soon, we're up in the air cruising along, and it's time to start the beverage service. I'm in charge of the first class area, so I get everyone their drinks and anything else they want, while Becky and the other attendants work the beverage service in economy. We're about halfway through the flight, high over the Atlantic Ocean, when Captain Castro steps out of the cockpit. I'm in the forward galley, so I glance at him, figuring he's just stepping out to use the restroom. You mind stepping in while I use the bathroom? He asks me. I nod. Ever since a German Wings flight crashed on purpose in 2015 by a co-pilot after the pilot stepped out to use the restroom, standard procedure has been to have at least two crew members in the cockpit at all times. I figured Glenn Mercer would have counted, but maybe not, since he's not officially a member of our crew. I step inside the cockpit as Castro closes the door behind me. Mercer sits in the jump seat to my right, slightly behind First Officer McCord who is on the right side of the cockpit. The world through the plane's windshield is dark. Nothing but a sliver of moon can be seen high in the night sky. That ringing starts in my ears again, along with the metallic taste invading my mouth. Hey, Jacob, First Officer McGuard says, glancing over his shoulder. How's first class treating you? Fine, I say, glancing down at Glenn Mercer. He's sweating. Perspiration is clearly visible on his forehead. Why? It's not hot in here. He looks at the back of McCord's head, ignoring me. I notice he's reaching into his right pants pocket and that he's unbuckled. Why is he unbuckled? He moves quickly, shooting his left hand out, shoving me away even as he's lurching up from his seat. A fancy metal pen is held in his right fist. Mercer jams the pen into the side of McCord's neck three times with quick, brutal movements. Blood spurts out of the first officer's neck as he gasps. Then Mercer is turning toward me as I'm pushing myself back up from the wall. He grabs me by the hair and wrenches my head to the side, exposing my neck. I get one hand up around his left wrist, leaving the other hand free to block the bloody pen he jabs toward me. We struggle and I get my head facing forward so he doesn't have a free shot at my jugular veins. He yanks his right hand back and then jams it toward my face again. I manage to stop his arm as the pen comes within a few inches of my left eye. Suddenly, a beeping noise comes from somewhere drawing Mercer's attention. I've been a flight attendant long enough to know that sound. It's the indicator noise that sounds when someone is requesting access to the flight deck from the passenger compartment. Normally, whoever is inside would toggle a switch to unlock the door briefly to allow access. But McCord is convulsing in the co-pilot seat. Blood is soaking his white shirt as he loses consciousness. The beeping stops, but I know it's not over. Captain Castro is clearly trying to get back in and I know he has an emergency code that he can use. Help! I call out. Captain, help! 
the beeping starts again. Castro has used his emergency code. It will continue for 30 seconds before the door unlocks. An emergency protocol designed in the unlikely event that both pilots become incapacitated. The only way to keep the door from unlocking is to shift the door control toggle into the lock position. I know that, but so does Mercer. He tries to yank his hand away from me, shifting so we can reach down between the two seats for the toggle switch. But I hold onto both his wrists, listening to the beeping, counting the seconds out in my head. Mercer turns back to me and whips his head forward, smashing the curve of his forehead into my nose. An explosion of pain erupts in my face, and I feel him slip his right hand from my grip, despite my efforts to the contrary. After a moment, the beeping stops. I can hear Castro banging on the cockpit door. The door will remain locked for five minutes, preventing Castro from using his code again during that time, unless the door is unlocked from the flight deck. Mercer turns back to me. I can see him as little more than a blur through the tears in my eyes. I raise my free hand toward his neck, but he bats it away and jams his pen into my left eye. I scream, falling to my knees in the cramped space. I can see the pen still sticking out of my left eye with my right eye. I'm vaguely aware, through the immense pain, of Mercer climbing into the pilot's seat. Moments later, the plane shifts, tilting nose down toward the dark ocean below. Fighting through the pain, knowing everyone on board will die if I don't do something, I wipe my right eye free of tears and look between the two seats, searching for the door toggle. After a moment, I find it, reaching toward it with my right hand. Before I can shift it into the unlock position, Mercer grabs my hand and yanks it away, violently dislocating my index and middle fingers. I shout in pain and jerk my hand away. Mercer reaches over and yanks McCord's limp body down by the head, slamming his skull into the center console right over the door lock switch. Cradling my hand, I feel like I'm going to vomit as blood and eye juice run down my cheeks. I watch as Mercer slams McCord's head to a pulp, destroying the door lock switch in the process. When he's done doing this, he turns back to the controls and aims the plane down even further, hurtling us toward the ocean at 600 miles an hour. I figure the angle of the plane is about 45 degrees. I've lost all track of time, with no idea how many minutes are left until Castro can try unlocking the door again. But I think we are getting close to the water. Besides, I have no idea if Mercer has damaged the door unlocking system permanently or not. I curse myself for ignoring the red flags that shot up like flares when I first saw Mercer. Just like I ignored the red flags that shot up when I was a kid, bothering my older brother for a new video game that had just come out. I hassled and cajoled him until he agreed to drive me to the mall that Saturday afternoon. But as soon as we got into his beat up Toyota Camry, a terrible feeling settled on me. Ringing ears, metallic taste, faint nausea. I ignored it, wanting the game so bad not understanding what I was feeling. We were standing in line at the game store when a pimply-faced teenager holding a semi-automatic rifle came striding into the store. He said nothing as he raised the weapon, shooting the employee behind the counter before firing at the customers in the place. My brother shoved me down behind a display of controllers before he took a bullet to the spine. I lived. He didn't. All because I ignored that feeling. But now it's not just one person paying for my inability to take drastic action. It's over 200. I could have done something. I should have done something, but I didn't. Thinking there's nothing left to do but wallow in my pain and wait to die, I look down and to my left, seeing a crash ax strapped to the wall. It's essentially a hatchet designed for breaking out of the cockpit in case of an emergency. With my left hand, the one that doesn't have two dislocated fingers, I reach out and pull the small axe out of its scabbard on the wall. As I get to my feet behind the pilot seat, I look out and see the sliver of moon reflecting off choppy ocean waves that are close enough to look like they take up the whole world. There's no time left, I realize. No way to save us all. No way to get Castro in here to right the plane before it hits the water. With my good eye, I look down at the axe in my left hand, then at Mercer's head. I catch a glimpse of the pen still sticking out of my ruined left eye. The pain has reached a point where it's everything and nothing. Maybe I'm going into shock. Maybe this is what shock feels like. Something tells me to drop the axe and forgive Mercer for the mass murder he's in the middle of committing. That something tells me it will be better to die without hate in my heart. To leave the world on good terms, even with those who have wronged me and others in the most heinous way possible. But then I think of my brother and the asshole who shot him. 
I glance out the windshield at the black ocean, then back down at Mercer's scalp. Forgive? I ask myself. Nah, I say, just before I slam the axe blade into his head. He screams, and we hit the water. My bladder woke me up, as it often did at least once a night. I'd been making a concerted effort to drink more water. It was one of the things I was working on while aboard the cargo ship, but it was playing hell with my sleep schedule. I'd seen a YouTube video about paying to travel by cargo ship, and the idea fascinated me. As an introvert and a writer who was struggling with alcoholism, spending a month on a cargo ship seemed like an ideal way to get my head right. The ship didn't allow alcohol on board, and there wasn't much to do during the day besides write. Plus, a crew of only 30 on such a massive ship made it so I didn't have to see anyone other than at the mess hall. Three meals a day were provided in the price of the voyage. At least, that had been the initial idea. Now, as I get up to use the restroom attached to my cabin quarters, I'd been on the ship for nearly two weeks, and I'd made good friends with several crew members. As it turned out, my procrastination knew no bounds. I'd only gotten about 8,000 words down in those two weeks, an abysmally low number. Instead, I'd been spending much of my time wandering the ship, hitting the gym, or hanging out in the rec room playing games and watching movies with off-shift crew members. But at least I wasn't drinking. There was that. I hit the light switch in the bathroom, but nothing happened. Still groggy with sleep, I didn't think much of it. I could see well enough in the dark to do my business. As I emptied my bladder, I noticed that the ship didn't feel like it was moving. That was strange, because we weren't supposed to make port for another two days. We were in the middle of the Atlantic, headed for the Strait of Gibraltar. When I was done in the head, I stepped to the cabin window, lifting the shade to peer out. It was the middle of the night, and I could see nothing but blackness outside. A tendril of fear coiled itself tightly in my stomach. The superstructure, where the crew cabins were, was always lit up at night. My window faced a stack of shipping containers some 20 yards away, but I'd always been able to see the containers during the night. Not anymore. It seemed the lights on the superstructure were out. I trudged toward the cabin door and hit the light switch. Nothing happened. No lights. I grabbed my phone and saw that the time was 3.11. I also noticed that I had no signal and no Wi-Fi. Outside my window, a flash of light caught my attention, followed shortly by a crack of thunder. Using the light on my phone to see by, I got dressed in jogging pants, a t-shirt, and my slip-on vans. When I opened the cabin door and stepped out into the hall, I was met with an eerie silence that permeated the dark on either side of my phone's flashlight beam. The low thrum of the engines was absent, the ship was as still as a corpse. Distantly, I heard the hesitant patter of rainfall. In moments, it turned into a full downpour. Without access to windows where I was in the hall, I didn't see any flashes of lightning, but I heard the cracks of thunder that inevitably followed. As I moved down the hall toward Abel Salino's quarters, I felt as if I were on a television show where I was the target of an elaborate prank. I tucked the idea into my memory banks to use in my writing, if I ever managed to sit down at my computer for more than a couple of hours a week. I pressed my ear against Salino's door, knowing he worked from 4 a.m. to 8 p.m. I wasn't sure what time he got up for work because I was always asleep during that time, so I listened for any movement. I heard none. Hesitant to wake him up, I headed further down the hall, unsure where I was going or what I hoped to accomplish. For all I knew, blackouts happened occasionally on the cargo ship, and the on-shift crew was working diligently to fix it. I guess I was just seeking some kind of verification that something was being done to correct the issue. I wanted to make sure we weren't just floating dead at sea. But of course we weren't. That would be ridiculous. Besides, with all the modern technology at our disposal, it wouldn't be such a big deal to let someone know. Maybe we could send out an emergency beacon or something. So even if we were dead in the water, it surely wouldn't be a life-threatening issue. Surely. I took the stairwell up toward the topmost floor of the superstructure, 
where I knew someone would always be on duty. I wasn't generally allowed inside the bridge, but I figured this counted as a bit of an emergency. Following my flashlight beam, I went up the final flight of stairs to the bridge, stepping through the door and into the dark navigation room. I shined my light around the wide open room, passing over various stations where crew members would sit while operating the ship. There was no one immediately visible on the bridge. That tendril in my gut coiled tighter, suddenly making me need to pee again. The rain came down in sheets outside. I could hear it clearly now that I was on the bridge, which was surrounded by windows. But I still couldn't see outside clearly. My light just reflected off the windows, making it impossible to see past the bright reflections. Hello? I called out. Something shifted off to my right. I whipped my phone that way, seeing nothing moving. No one was there. The thought of a stiff drink stuck in my mind like an arrow as my hands started to shake with fear. I resisted the urge to flee back down to my room, still clinging to the idea that there was a logical explanation for this. Maybe everyone was down in the electrical room, trying to get the power back on. I moved forward, stepping past a row of stations and shining my light to the right, toward where the sound had originated. My beam landed on gleaming streaks of crimson snaking across the floor. The shaking beam followed them up toward their source as if acting on its own. The captain stared up at me from where he lay on the floor underneath the station. Blood stained his starched white shirt and soaked his gray black goatee. I flinched back from his pleading eyes and the sight of the gaping hole in his upper abdomen. It almost looked as though the hole had been burned into him, given the crisp blackening of his shirt. Both his blood-coated hands fell gingerly around the hole just under his rib cage, as if he couldn't believe it was there. He raised one hand now and pointed toward the windows that lined the front of the bridge. I turned my head and peered into the darkness. The thought of having a drink was the only thing keeping me from fleeing. A flash of lightning illuminated the stacks of cargo containers arrayed before me. For the briefest of moments, I saw that one of the containers had a gaping hole in its side like something had exploded inside of it. Twisted metal reached into the wet night like gnarled fingers. The lightning did nothing to illuminate the interior of the metal container. It was as mysterious as that fist-sized hole in the captain. When I looked back at him, both his hands rested on his abdomen and his eyes stared at me, but he was no longer moving. His eyes were waxy and unblinking. The rain outside was intensifying no longer coming down straight, but at an angle. The cargo ship was beginning to rock on the waves that seemed to be growing larger and more violent with each passing moment. I moved over toward what looked like a radio. I picked up the microphone and said something I'd only ever heard in movies. Mayday, mayday, is anyone there? There was nothing, not even the static hum of white noise. I knew calling 911 wouldn't work on my phone. There wasn't a cell tower close enough to pick up any signal. Glancing at an expensive looking electronic station next to me, I noticed that a hole had been torn in the top of the thing. A hole about the same size as the one in the now dead captain. The smell of melted electrical wiring wafted up from the gash in the equipment. Could the thing have blown up and killed the captain? I steered away from that train of thought. The ship was rocking more violently with each passing moment. I had to find a way to get a distress signal out. And I figured my best bet was the electrical room. Maybe I could find a way to get the power back on. With my light leading the way, I rushed off the bridge and down the stairs, checking the layout placards at each floor. I knew I'd seen the electrical room on a placard during one of my ship-wandering procrastination sessions. The ship started rocking more and more as I made my way down. I stumbled into walls and only kept myself from falling down the stairs by keeping a tight grip on the railing. I found the placard with the location of the electrical room on the third floor down. As I moved, stumbling down the hall toward the electrical room, I passed open cabin doors, but I didn't dare look inside. I didn't want to see anyone else who'd been injured like the captain. The door to the electrical room swung open with the movement of the boat as I came within a few yards of it. Then it swung closed as the ship yawed the other direction, but it didn't latch as it swung closed, and I soon saw why. Both the latch and the lock had been broken, as though someone had smashed through the door from the outside. Fearing I would find all the electrical equipment sabotaged, I rushed to the room as the door swung back open. 
stopping in the doorway with my left arm holding the door and my right hand shining my flashlight inside. What the? I said as I looked. Members of the crew stood in the electrical room, pressed up against the towering stacks of electrical equipment that were responsible for routing electricity throughout the ship. Their faces were flat against the towers, their hands at their sides. Despite the increasingly violent rocking of the ship, they didn't move. It was like they were stuck to the equipment somehow. The sound of rushing footsteps behind me tore my attention away from the strange scene in the room. Still bracing myself against the door jam, I turned and saw two beams of light bouncing down the hall. I shined my light that way, picking out Salino and Garcia. They looked at me, fear and confusion plain on their faces. Del Rey? Salino called. That you? You guys better come look at this, I said. They moved warily down the hall as the ship rolled on the waves. When they reached me and looked into the electrical room, their fear and confusion only intensified. Patterson, Garcia said, moving to one of the crew members in the room. What are you doing, man? He asked, reaching out to grab Patterson's shoulder. He immediately yanked his hand away and shook it. He's hot, Garcia said, looking at us. A sound like metal bending rang out as Patterson stepped stiffly back from the electrical equipment and tottered around to face us. We all put our lights on his face, and we all sucked in a shocked breath at what we saw. Patterson's eyes were scorched balls of carbon around burnt eyelids. His mouth was open, and smoke that smelled of ozone floated from between blackened teeth. Something moved in his chest, and I shifted my light down, seeing a scorched hole in his shirt about the size of a softball. A sharp, snake-like face poked out of the wound in Patterson's abdomen, just below his ribcage. Two bright blue eyes with black irises stared at us, unblinking. Behind Patterson, I could see a hole in the metal electrical tower, much like the one I'd seen on the bridge. Suddenly, all of the other crew members in the electrical room turned toward us. They all had identical wounds in their abdomens, with identical faces sticking out. I moved back, getting between Salino and Garcia as fear had my legs all but vibrating. As I stepped backward into the hall, the creature shot out from Patterson's abdomen, seeming to fly across the room. I caught a glimpse of an eel-like body glistening with blood. It had four small legs with sharp claws. It scurried in the air as it flew, seemingly propelled by its powerful tail. It landed on Salino's chest, its mouth opening. A two-pronged tongue flicked out of its mouth and shot into Salino's abdomen, puncturing his skin and causing him to scream. I turned to run ducking into the nearest open cabin and slamming the door. Screams bounced down the hallway as I backed into the room. The ship rolled violently, tossing me down. It rolled back the other way, and I slid along the floor, hitting the door. Gravity seemed to flip, and suddenly the door was the floor. But it kept going. Some faraway part of my mind realized that the ship was capsizing. Suddenly, the ceiling was the floor. All the crew members' possessions crashed around as they fell out of the drawers and cabinets. The screams continued from the hall for a few minutes before suddenly stopping. Water started leaking through the window and around the door, steadily filling the upside-down room. I stood in the corner of the room, holding my phone, terrified to leave, knowing it wouldn't do any good. The entire superstructure was underwater now. But something caught my attention, floating among the debris. It was a liquor bottle, with about a third of its brown liquid left inside. I snatched it out of the cool water clamped it under an armpit and opened it with my free hand. Before I could stop myself, I chugged a good quarter of what was left. The hazy warmth spread out from my guts, uncoiling that tendril of fear just a little bit. I smiled as the water reached my knees. The door to the room crashed open, revealing Garcia with one of those eels sitting in his abdomen. I shined my flashlight at the water around his knees, seeing dozens of those strange eels swimming toward me. I upended the bottle and chugged more as the creatures approached. There was no more electricity on the ship, no more but what ran through my body and whatever was left over in the bodies of the remaining crew members. And they wanted it. Well, I thought as I finished the contents of the bottle, they're going to get it. Thanks for listening. If you enjoy these stories, be sure to subscribe to the podcast and check out some more of my episodes here.